And the day has finally come. I guess there's no sense in continuing to put it off. I finally have to look at the black sheep of the Dead Space franchise, a game that I'm sure most of you are aware carries just a little bit of infamy along with it. But infamy aside, I do plan on approaching this like I have with my previous retrospectives, which means giving it an honest and fair look despite what everyone else thinks about it. Which actually should be pretty easy as not only have I never played the game before today, but I really haven't watched a lot of reviews covering it. So for the very last time, it is my extreme pleasure to say, ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the Dead Space. Ret Come join me. Make us whole again. After Dead Space 2's lackluster sales numbers, a third game in the series wasn't exactly a sure thing, but after about a year of speculation and leaks, we finally got confirmation that a new DS game was indeed being worked on. Now, it's no secret that EA took a much stronger position in some of the decision making this time around, and I don't think I'll be ruffling any feathers when I say that presence can be felt all over the game, and sadly most of the time it's in the worst ways imaginable. And that really is a tragedy, one that I will talk about at great length throughout this video, trust me, but I do think it's important to err on the side of objectivity here by making sure none of those negatives taint any of Dead Space 3's accomplishments. Don't get me wrong, I am no fan of EA, and more to the point, I cannot stand their practices regarding DLC and altering a game's core gameplay style just to turn a better profit. But honestly, I feel like that's all I ever hear about Dead Space 3, so from here on out, just keep in mind I'm going into this relatively blind and hoping for a good time. For all I know, that may be something I don't end up finding, and if that is the case, you guys will definitely hear all about it. But I'm not interested in shitting on a game just because it's popular to do so. And with that in mind, let's see if this game's story is worthy of bookending such a well-loved franchise. And I'm coming out of the gate swinging here. Dead Space 3, in my opinion, does a pretty good job at capping the franchise off, at least as far as the story goes. With the books, movies, comics, and spin-off games, we got a whole lot of DS lore, and after playing and watching all these pieces of media for months on end, what I really wanted was a satisfying conclusion to the series. And this is definitely not coming from a, God, I hope this series ends soon sort of place. I really did love these experiences I had, but a part of me also wanted to see the kind of climactic ending I knew these guys were totally capable of. So maybe we should jump right in because there's a lot to talk about here. Hey! What is it? What's going on? Nothing, nothing. Everything's fine. Dead Space 3 starts off with a really good recap of the previous games and even the events taking place long before the first game, like the formation of the Unitologist Church. Although, if you haven't played those previous games, this sequence is going to spoil a lot of really cool revelations that you might have otherwise discovered on your own. Although, I guess if you're the type of person who would go into the third game of a franchise without playing the titles that came before, you aren't likely to care about that. The game proper starts with a sequence showing events that happened hundreds of years ago on a strange icy planet called Tal Volantis. Now, these events will be further expanded on later in the game, but as far as an Enmedius Res introduction goes, it sets up a pretty awesome mystery. Who are these guys? Why are they looking for this codex? Why are there necromorphs all over? And why is our character being rewarded for his hard work with a good sized hole to the head? Glad to hear that. All that will be further contextualized later, but after the pre intro, we're taken to a dingy apartment where Isaac Clark lives alone. According to the game, him and Ellie from the last game had a nice little happy life together, but as the necromorph scourge spread and threatened all life in the galaxy, a little bit of a wedge was formed. It seems like Ellie is looking for a way to keep what she experienced on the sprawl from happening everywhere else, but after what Isaac has been through being used by the Marker, EarthGov, and the Unitologist, our guy understandably just wants to live out the rest of his life avoiding ever coming into contact with any of those things again. He seems to have taken a very defeatist kind of, oh well, what are you going to do type of attitude, and this is what drove Ellie away. Now, I've seen a lot of people criticize this move, but I don't know, it sort of makes sense to me from a narrative standpoint. 
Here's a guy who's seen terrible things, been experimented on, has come close to death a countless amount of times, and held many full conversations with his ex-girlfriend who just so happens to be long dead. Honestly, I might develop a little distaste for humanity myself in that situation. But Ellie is really gung-ho on finding a way to save the human race, and since that would include the people who repeatedly stuck a fuck-off needle into his eye on multiple occasions, well, Isaac's not so into that idea. So, since then, Isaac has been living the bachelor life until EarthGov busts in and not so subtly insinuates he might want to take part in a rescue mission. You know, the kind of subtlety that comes at the end of a gun. So it turns out Ellie joins some kind of military civilian task force charged with finding the origin of the markers with the hopes that this will end the apocalypse that humanity is facing. However, she went missing and before that, according to her, Isaac's the only guy who can finish the fight. Surprise, surprise. On top of that, it seems like the Unitologist Church has reached its final form as some kind of religious insurgency type of thing, looking to speed up the whole end of all human life. And bet your sweet ass they are very much aware of the guy who's been thwarting them this entire time, aka Isaac Clark. I actually really like this setup. It feels very cinematic, the way that the writers have set up a situation where most human beings in the galaxy are in a panic which allows a small contingency of religious zealots to form an armed force that's big enough the government, who's mostly worrying about killing these walking corpses with ships for arms, can't exactly do much about them. This is a genuinely tense situation and it feels appropriately bleak given the context of the full Dead Space series. On the way to getting off the planet, Isaac runs into this absolute gem of a guy who's running the aforementioned Unitologist Uprising. They know Clark is the one who stopped them in the past and they are fully aware that he can destroy markers thanks to his special position as one of the only people alive to have come in close proximity to one without completely losing it or turning into a mess of bones and flesh. Speaking of which, these guys have been going around to major human colonies and destroying the structures that house these newly manufactured man-made markers, so they're the ones who've been spreading these necromorph outbreaks which would explain why the problem still persists after Clark destroyed the marker in part 2. Which gives us this really nice start. There's the government initiative that is about as effective and well put together as any bureaucratic product, and then there's the unis who are looking to cap not only Isaac, but the rest of the world as well, so they can bring about their idea of a utopia. One where every living being is, well, dead. Isaac can't stand EarthGov because of what they did to him, and he's not exactly fond of the Unitologist either, so he's really only here to save Ellie, and I sort of like that. While throughout the series, he's sort of been the chosen one type of character, He's always seemed to resist that idea. Seems to me like the guy just wants to be left alone to draw scribbles of markers on his wall and not get needles shoved into his eye. I feel like that's an understandable position to take, but instead he's heading to an ice ball of a planet with the intention of saving yet another ex-girlfriend. And after a little bit of regrouping, our team makes their way to Ellie's last known position where they fall prey to the same exact thing that took Ellie's ship down. This leads the rescue team to finally catching up with her and her crew, but more important than that, it looks like our girl has moved on and is slapping skins with this dork now. So with the initial goal completed, now they shift gears into figuring out why the ship graveyard's out here, why there's active mines all over, and why every single detail seems to be pushing them in the direction of Tau Volantis. Once on the actual planet, a process that goes just about as smoothly as anything else that involves Isaac Clark, the group find out that this planet is believed to be the Marker homeworld the origin point that connects all of the markers that have been found throughout the galaxy, and the Sovereign Colony's Armed Forces, which I think is a separate entity to EarthGov, we're here to figure out exactly how this could be used to help mankind. If all the corpses weren't a dead giveaway though, they didn't exactly find what they were looking for. In fact, all of the info we found shows that some kind of order was given that all people taking part in this expedition were to kill themselves to keep something a secret. And again, this was an amazing story point for me. The side documents and audio logs scattered all over the colony paint this familiar picture of people starting to lose their shit, but this time around the government seems to be trying to nip it in the bud by having everyone who even knows about the expedition eat a bullet. Come on, Valerie. Just put that down. I'm sorry. They don't have to know. I'm so sorry. I'm Not as sorry as I am, Commander. So I obviously started wondering what the hell could have been so important that everyone here had to die. It wasn't that the marker caused necromorphs, I mean, we knew that already, so what the hell was going on down here? Well, that's a question that I sadly won't be able to answer without some massive spoilers for both the base game and the DLC that essentially acts as its true ending. So if you haven't played Dead Space 3 yet, either click on the link in the description or skip to the timestamp on screen because we will be going in deep here and I'd rather you guys piece this story together yourselves. Sound like a plan? All right, let's do it. You've got me. 
Let the others go. So through a combination of written files, audio logs, and story interactions, we find out that this was never the Marker homeworld, but on the plus side, we weren't the only ones who were confused about this. Instead of an origin point, this place seems to be where an alien race tried to accomplish the same exact goal that we came here to do. And when I say we, I mean humankind. These aliens found the markers too and were looking to use them for their own ends, but just like us, met an awful end thanks to the markers' true purpose, which seems to be to assimilate all life into these huge moons made out of flesh. So we essentially came here assuming these aliens created the marker and thought that we could learn how to harness it for ourselves, but instead found out these guys knew just about as much as we did, and similarly when they found out exactly what would happen when the marker was activated, made some kind of failsafe that completely iced the planet over, killing off their entire race with the hopes of saving all life in the galaxy. And as a little side note here, I absolutely loved this because it was such a great misdirection. I went through the entire game just assuming I would finally see who was behind these markers, but they pulled the rug out from under me in the most satisfying way. After finding out about this alien race, we figure out these guys built a failsafe into their machine which would destroy the planet's moon, which was in the process of becoming one of these balls of living flesh. So our group gets a hold of the means to do this, but Danik, you know the guy who looks like Elton John, well, he's also on the planet, and the codex that would let us destroy the moon can also set it free to devour whatever it comes across. During our scuffle with the unis, we see Ellie die, which was actually very emotional, but I know I wasn't the only one who could tell they were going to reveal this to not be true in the future. And we end up with this Sophie's Choice where we have to decide between letting the only person Isaac loves die or doom all of existence to a fate worse than death. And for some reason, the emotionally cold person on the team is the one who makes the decision for us. The ending of Dead Space 3 was this really great self-sacrificing moment that really struck a chord with me. Someone has to be present to activate this machine and crash the moon into the planet and Isaac knows it's gotta be him. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I want the guy to die, but it's an understandable mindset. He's doing this to save everyone, but especially Ellie, and the scene where she realizes this is a real gut punch. It was this great little moment of someone sacrificing themselves to save everyone else, and I thought it was very fitting. So I'm disappointed to say that this is all undone after the credits, with Clark trying to contact Ellie. I don't know, it just kind of felt cheap to me. They did the same thing at the end of Dead Space 2, but we knew another sequel was coming. I think these guys were trying to bookend the series and it just seems really odd to end it that way. But you absolutely can't sell DLC for a game if you kill off the main character in the last entry, so we're left with this. Which brings us to the DLC campaign Awakened, a series of events that take place just after the end of the game and serves as what you might call the real ending to the series. Awakened starts off confirming that both Clark and Carver made it out of their ordeal alive, even if they don't really get how. So the rest of the story is spent with them just trying to get off the planet. For a while, Clark assumes that them getting off the planet is exactly what the Marker wants so they can lead the moon straight to Earth, but after a little digging, it turns out that's old news as far as the markers are concerned. They already know exactly where Earth is, so the two jump in a ship to warn everyone, and when they finally get home, the happy ending turns into a nightmare when they see several of these brethren moons already there. Seems like while they were out, the world sort of ended. A conclusion that, I guess, really fits the series if you ask me. I mean, Dead Space was always very, very bleak, and I think this is probably the only route they could have taken while staying true to the general feel of the franchise. The only thing I would have changed would be, well, for Clark to stay dead. I know this would have killed any sequel potential, but come on, it was the perfect bookend to all the shit the guy's been through. The thought of him finally bowing out of the series was sad as hell, and it hit like a freight train, and undoing all that after the credits sort of made it feel cheap. But I can admit there is also a part of me that was happy to see him make it out okay. In fact, as I'm writing this, I'm realizing that him dying outright would have been a mercy compared to him living through all this only to show up and be devoured by a moon-sized collection of dead bodies, so maybe we'll call this one even. And with that in mind, let's get the newcomers back in here. I still don't understand how we survived. Maybe we didn't. So to summarize things, I feel like Dead Space 3's ending was pretty damn satisfying, and the devs at least had the foresight not to include too many sequel hooks that would have made the game's conclusion feel more like a to be continued than a the end. Which goes for the game's vanilla ending and not the one included in the Awakening DLC, a piece of story that actually finishes the game's events with a price tag of $9.99. Now I have some well established feelings on DLC and, well, I kind of hate it. In fact, ever since its advent, I may have purchased maybe two or three pieces of DLC max. But first and foremost, while the events at the end of Awakening are really cool in a fan fiction sort of way, 
They are in no way required, at least in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, it's a cool ending, but it's the kind of ending you probably already theorized in your head by the time you finish the credits in the base game. Plus, this DLC is still costing $9.99 when I got the entirety of Dead Space 3 for half of that does scream bullshit money-making scam to me. So I guess play it if you got it in some kind of bundle, but don't go out of your way thinking it'll provide a more satisfying ending than the actual game, because if anything, it's just the same scenario but stretched out over an hour. So if you're planning on playing Dead Space 3 specifically for the story, just know there's some cool stuff going on inside this DLC, but none of it is a must-play type of deal. And on that note, I honestly do recommend you guys play this game for its story. It definitely does feel like a departure from the other two main titles, but in my opinion, this is about the only way they could have ended the series. As most of you may know by now, the Dead Space MO has always been having Isaac play a small role in the events of the overarching plot, using the guise of him escaping some gruesome situation as a way of keeping the general events of the larger story relatively small compared to the Mariana Trench of things going on outside that escape plan. Well, in 3, all of those chickens come home to roost, and we finally get a few answers to some of the questions that, I don't know about you, but were burning a hole in the back of my mind for a while. On top of this, we get what I would call a very movie-feeling plot, with Isaac and crew exploring a pool of environments that were really interesting in this Indiana Jones globetrotting sort of way. Don't you worry, the good stuff is still relegated to discoverable text and audio logs, a move that, as a fan of Resident Evil, I 100% back. And we're also dealing with a much larger cast than in previous entries, which I know does pull away from the generally isolating feel of the other games in the series, but don't you worry, the game still spends most of its latter runtime contriving reasons for the team to split up. So all's not lost in that sense. However, there are some issues I had with this Dead Space Swan song. First up, I really didn't like how hard they were trying to get me to hate Ellie's new boyfriend. Good to see you made it, Isaac. Yeah, you know, maybe we should give you two some time alone, huh? A, I'm already on Team Isaac, that shit's not necessary. B, it felt like cheap writing in order to force an emotional response from the player, which I don't appreciate. A feeling that comes back as members of the team keep individually getting picked off as the story progresses. Instead of getting to know these people and being sad when they eventually die, I was racking my brain trying to predict which teammate would bite it after what cutscene. Now, I'm fully aware that a good writer will try to induce these kinds of emotions in the player, but good writing makes that process nearly invisible to the untrained eye. My point is, go ahead and kill off major characters all you want, just don't make it so obvious that you're trying to manipulate me when you do it. And as far as complaints go, I did have one final issue. Throughout the game, because RE5 happened and the entire game industry is committed to not letting any of us forget that, Dead Space 3 was made with co-op multiplayer in mind, which means making room for another main character. In the co-op mode, you get a lot of interaction between these two, which builds the new guy's character up a bit and makes it feel like he's went through some kind of arc. But if, like me, you'd rather play these games solo, you get to a point where Carter starts acting like he's been through some kind of development and formed a bond with Isaac, despite the fact that for a majority of the game, I might have said a total of six words to the guy. So when he ends up asking Isaac about redemption and being a bad person, it comes out of left field and gives the impression that he's been going through a lot of personal growth just off screen where you can't see. Is that what a good man does? Good men mean well. You just don't always end up doing well. Definitely not the worst issue with a story I've ever seen, but it is a damning look into what took precedence in D3's design process. Functionality, innovation, and on-brand storytelling took a dead serious backseat to placating common gaming trends for the time, a trend that you will see repeating itself a lot during this video. But don't let that get you down. Dead Space 3, for all intents and purposes, had a really cool story. I enjoyed seeing Isaac Clarke finally turn into the hero he's been avoiding like the plague this entire series, and even though I complained about it just a second ago, Carver definitely grew on me a surprising amount for the little I actually interacted with him in the single player mode. I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't be. We're not friends. Seeing Ellie return, but having her just out of reach, both realistically and relationship wise, was a pretty smart way of giving the players what they want, but still using her as a motivating goal without ruining the will-they-won't-they they vibe we got from part two. The set-piece driven, more action movie bend a lot of the elements take in this last entry can feel a little more like Uncharted than Dead Space, but I think it still fits in some weird way. Plus, the soundtrack did an amazing job of amplifying the emotional scenes and the overall mystery. Would I have loved a return to the more atmospheric droning noises like we saw in the first two games? Sure, but the more cinematic orchestral approach does a great job of building and releasing tension, so color me on board with it. Look, like I've said a million times already, it is a bit of a departure and I could totally understand diehard fans being upset at that change, but 
Coming from a guy who newly became a fan of the series, it seems to still have that Dead Space heart beating underneath the more flashy elements added here. There may be a lot of reasons to stay away from what was essentially EA the video game, but I'd say the story is not one of them. Even if you've heard all the complaints and have sworn this title off for what I would call very valid reasons, at least watch a playthrough of the game on YouTube. Trust me, the story is one area that I can say confidently survived EA's mishandling, something I definitely can't say about the gameplay. <sighs> Alright, let's crack this egg. On paper, it would seem like Visceral's got a pretty simple job here. You just take the winning formula of Isaac Clarke needing to escape some form of necromorph outbreak and then apply it to a new game with some minute additions or changes. It seems like an easy home run, but we're dealing with some odd circumstances for this release. Like I mentioned in my other videos, Dead Space 1 really took off in the sales charts, maybe surprisingly so, but Dead Space 2 made back only a small portion of the money EA invested in the project. So when it came time to release a new entry in the series, you best believe EA was breathing over Visceral's shoulder the entire time, influencing them to incorporate mechanics seen in other popular games at the time, and pushing a bigger emphasis on multiplayer and in-game microtransactions. A scenario that should surprise no one as it's the EA hustle we've been used to for what seems like two decades now. So when I go through the results of all this with a fine tooth comb, just keep in mind these guys were literally listening to their bosses, and since their bosses were the ones footing the bill, I don't think you can blame them for a whole lot, or at least that seems to be the case to me. To be totally honest, I haven't seen a lot of direct information that points at EA as being the ones who made these changes and not visceral themselves, but we do have a historically recognizable pattern here, and if precedence is good enough to work in the US court system, I feel like it's good enough for my terrible YouTube videos. And with that damning lead-in, why don't we go over the scant amount that has stayed the same and the ocean of changes to be found here in Dead Space 3. First of all, a lot of the more surface level elements that don't require a lot of deep analysis to understand are all here to varying degrees. For example, you're still playing a third person over the shoulder shooter with an emphasis on limb dismemberment. Progression is still handled in a very straight line sort of manner, only this time having a few portions of the game that allow for backtracking and exploration, only it's in such small amounts that it feels like an idea no one really wanted to commit to. Your inventory, shooting, item gathering, interactions, and weapon upgrades all pretty much work exactly like you're used to, but there's a little more going on under the surface. Like I alluded to before, this game was a clear case of too many cooks in the kitchen, or possibly too many recipes in the single dish might be a better descriptor. The amount of elements added in the game that weren't present in the last two could fill a damn book. First off, we have a change in the fundamental way the game is played. In the last games, taking a limb off an enemy was the best way to take them down, and technically that's still the case here, but there's a few additions that led to this being shoved out as an optimal strategy. And to talk about that further, we're going to need to go over a few more changes that made it possible. So not only is there now a cover mechanic, but to make that worth putting in, we also have enemies with guns. And I think we can all agree that's exactly what an atmospheric horror game needs, is more shootouts between space marines. And with the addition of these new enemies, some changes needed to be made to the existing cast of baddies to sort of balance the mixture. So what we're left with is a roster of necromorphs that must be at least twice as fast as even the most nimble bad guys in DS1 or 2. And at first, you would think this move would be more in my specific corner as DS2's rock-solid, in-your-face, action-packed gameplay was one of my biggest compliments, but... Well, the word poor balancing comes to mind a lot here. Since each enemy in the game moves much faster than your average necromorph, they can get to you much faster. Makes sense, right? Well, if these guys are closing the gap and the limb dismemberment is supposed to be a relatively slow process with enemies still able to damage you with just a single arm on their lonely torso, well, your strategy is going to have to change up a bit. On the hard difficulty, it was taking me around three or four direct hits to cut off a leg or an arm, but an automatic weapon like a rifle or Uzi basically served the same purpose, but had a rate of fire that actually made it a viable option. And trust me, it took me a very long time to figure this little tidbit out. In the previous games, automatic weapons were very much situational, so when I started this game up, I was trying to play it like an actual Dead Space title, and it just was not working for me which led to the first two or three hours of the game being incredibly frustrating. I kept playing it like other DS games and trying to make use of the plasma cutter, but as soon as I figured out a faster firing weapon that caused a bit of hit stun does the same job but much more efficiently, well the plasma cutter quickly rotated out of my lineup.
Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. If the difficulty was a big draw for me in part two, why the hell am I complaining about it in part three? Well, that's the issue. It's actually a really easy game. Sure, I was getting hit like it was going out of style, but look at my inventory in the first 20 or 30 minutes of starting it up. What we're looking at right now is more healing items than I could conceivably need for the next hour or two of gameplay. In fact, it wasn't until the last 30 minutes of the game that I ever had to craft a healing item myself. Before that point, I was regularly just throwing away healing items because they were clogging up space in my inventory for ammo. So what's the issue then? Well, the game isn't very satisfying for more than half of its runtime, or at least it wasn't for me. I found that I kept taking these bullshit hits during combat. Now, like I said, I could heal these injuries no problem, and even if I did die, more often than not, I would just respawn inside the very same room. I just wasn't enjoying myself. The enemies I was facing were given a huge boost in speed, and in return, all I got was this terrible dive roll that just looks dumb as hell in a Dead Space game. And on top of that, it was kind of hard to do on the fly in the PC version for some reason, or maybe my head just wasn't translating very well into a Dead Space game where I had to do a lot of evasive maneuvers. So to sum things up, I just really wasn't satisfied with the combat thanks to a few tweaks made in the necromorphs.ini. But I'm not exactly shitting on the game, and there's a reason for that. It becomes incredibly fun when a few milestones get met, and it's then that I finally saw the appeal here. Now, to tell you this story, I do have to start from the beginning. At first, I figured out the plasma cutter just wasn't cutting it, pun intended, so I went against my dead space instincts and used an automatic firearm for my main weapon, but I was still lacking a lot of stopping power. So I made myself a shotgun, and you would assume, well, there you have it, problem solved, right? Well, once again, we're going to have to go over another addition. Dead Space, among their nearly infinite list of changes, implemented a universal ammunition system. This means all ammo you find can be used in all the weapons you have. So if you have several hundred rounds of ammo, the developers are going to have to nerf the more powerful weapons, and they did that so that this game's version of the BFG, or whatever its most powerful variant of a weapon is, doesn't make up your main arsenal all the time. And in that spirit, the shotgun is nearly unusable for a majority of the game. The reason being, it takes roughly two and a half weeks for Isaac to recover from a single shot. And you'll remember, one of my complaints was that enemies are now much faster and more aggressive. So if I do take a shot with a shotgun and it doesn't happen to knock the enemy back, well, that's a guaranteed hit, period. Now, this game does allow you to essentially combine weapons, making two guns out of one physical body, but you can't fire one weapon while the other one is still in its post-fire state. So throughout the entire time, there was some invisible countdown that was keeping me from firing the more reasonable weapon for seconds after firing the shotgun, and this also applies to changing weapons, which means firing the damn shotgun is a commitment the game really expects you to buckle down and deal with. So for a good long period, I was stuck in this limbo where, yeah, technically I could kill enemies, but it just wasn't fun like it was in Dead Space 2. I was just kind of going through the motions to beat the game and get the footage, and getting more and more frustrated along the way. That is, until I discovered the resources needed to build an explosive option. At first, I had a grenade launcher at my disposal, but with some modification, it turned into a rocket launcher. Now I was a serious threat to these necromorphs, but to balance my newly acquired godlike power, I had to make sure I didn't use this thing in close quarters because the splash damage would take me out even faster than the necromorphs I was shooting at. And on a completely unrelated side note, including the stasis effect to my shots made these mortal mistakes turn into some kind of slow motion, hilarious reminder of just how dumb I was being. But it wasn't long after this that I found an upgrade that makes my rocket splash damage do absolutely nothing to me, and from here on out, calling it a cakewalk would be an insult to the hard work that goes into walking on a cake. I was steamrolling everything I came across, and the stasis coating meant even hits that weren't kills slowed down enemies long enough that I was able to get off another shot with no issue. And oddly enough, this is when the game became actually fun. When I finally found the right combination of guns and buffs, I could actually enjoy encounters, but... Sadly, every upgrade that came after that just made the game easier and easier till I started using the plasma cutter again just to insert some kind of difficulty back into the experience. So I think it's safe to say that either EA or Visceral had issues seeing that making tiny changes at the foundation level might affect nearly every single aspect of the game that made it recognizably dead space. 
a sentiment that carries over into the other popular gaming mechanics shoved into this title with little to no care. Building off the limited amount of weapon customization that could be found in the other games, DS3 has you collecting resources meant to craft your weapons. Every little aspect of your guns can be customized, and to be totally honest, I really enjoyed this aspect of the game. I spent a very, very long time in front of these benches just trying to tweak every little aspect of my weapons to make them perfect, and to be totally honest with you, I kind of got flashbacks of Parasite Eve 1, which is a really good thing. These collectible resources made exploration way more fun and gave me an actual, tangible reason to go off the beaten path. Every time I came across one of these workbenches, I would be drawn back into making tiny micro-adjustments to certain parts of my lineup with the intention of finally making a weapon that felt really good to use. Which led me to the insane realization that I was having way more fun customizing these weapons than I was having actually using them on Necromorphs. On top of crafting and tweaking guns, it's also possible to find or craft upgrades that affect their stats. So you might figure this would be the solution to my shotgun complaints, but at the point in the game where the shotgun was actually viable, giving it my best rate of fire upgrades didn't even move the needle, leading me to feel like they might have hard-coded some attributes into certain weapons as some kind of twisted misunderstanding of what balance is. That being said, as I entered the late game, I was absolutely dripping with huge stat-increasing upgrades. But by this point, the old rocket launcher mounted to a machine gun approach was the absolute best answer to anything the game could possibly throw at me, meaning we're left with a little detective work to do here. Either we assume that a game studio that has shown twice already that they really understand the intricacies of making a mechanically satisfying game totally shit the bed on one of the most important factors that goes into a third-person shooter, which I guess is technically possible but not very plausible given this situation, or by their hand or EA's, the game was purposely altered, incentivizing spending real-life money on resources, weapons, and upgrades that bring the game to a playable state. Of course, I can't really say for certain which one of these scenarios led to this idiocy, but I think we all know what option is the most likely. It seems very clear to me that the early game was purposely made frustrating or at least less mechanically solid, with the direct intention of leading players straight into the pretty substantial list of pay-to-win extras that are still available today. And I doubt very much there's a lot of you that are looking to disagree because, well, you know, EA. So on the plus side, I did finally get to a point where the game satisfied me in the same way Part 2 did, but on the negative side, by that point the game was nearly over, and it wasn't too long after that that I was able to essentially break the game over my knee. And keep in mind, I didn't go into this with that intention. I mean, we're talking about a guy who never uses Code Veronica's knife or Final Fantasy Tactics item duplication trick specifically because I like a good fair challenge. I guess I just have no intention of making games less fun for me. And speaking of which, the next stupid mid-2000s gaming trend to be forced on a Dead Space players was the old reliable RE5-inspired partner mechanic, a system so poorly implemented into the main game that it seems the developers or EA just never expected anyone to play this game single player. All over the place you'll find consoles with two terminals clearly meant to be used in tandem with a friend, and rooms only people playing in multiplayer can even enter. Now, you'd figure the game trying to copy RE5's partner system would at the very least copy the part of it where your partner is always there, either being driven by another person or the AI. But instead, Dead Space keeps the second player's avatar the hell away from you in the single player. So when you think about it, there are two separate experiences to be had with Dead Space 3, and one of them got the lion's share of the attention. And it feels a little dirty taking an amazingly fun, single-player, story-driven, atmospheric horror game and shoehorning in a type of gameplay that would see your core audience that is to say people looking for a fun, single-player, story-driven, atmospheric horror game, sucking hind teeth. Listen, I'm not saying no game should be cooperative multiplayer, but come on, you could have at least shown the restraint it took Capcom to wait till the fifth entry before you started pulling shit like this. So after all this complaining, what's the conclusion here? Well, it looks like an absolute shit ton of features were baked into this game, and if you ask me, a majority of it was to the game's detriment. Now don't get me wrong, sequels are supposed to add to their predecessors, but these are supposed to be baby steps, meaning you probably shouldn't add seven separate new game mechanics to an established series and expect it to retain some kind of an identity afterwards. Honestly, if you ask me, this could have been called 2013 The Video Game and it would have made a lot more sense. But I am going to level with you guys. Even though I just spent a dead serious four pages in this script complaining about the game, I did have a lot of fun here. All of my pissing and moaning wasn't because this is a bad game, it's more frustration that this game is nowhere near as good as it could have been and as the others used to be. 
The combat, when I actually had the tools for it, was really fun, and even though you could argue they went overboard with the massive amount of action set pieces, I gotta say, they're pretty damn exciting, and they're spread out enough that it doesn't feel like a Call of Duty title or anything. After leaving his apartment, Isaac and the crew get stranded out in the space around Tal Volantis, and while I wouldn't call it open world, it certainly gives you more options than the typical Dead Space game, even if those options do add up to a single non-essential destination. Honestly, at first, I thought this was going to turn into something more akin to Stalker or Metro Exodus, where we would have smaller, more open areas to explore with side objectives scattered all around. A style I would love to see walking around in a dead space suit one of these days. The puzzles may not be Silent Hill tier mind exercises, but there are a shit ton of them, and they straddle that fine line between easy enough to figure out that the solution is clear after a few seconds of looking at them, and challenging enough that you aren't just going through the paces each time you come across one. If you'll remember, one of my issues with Part 2 is that there weren't a lot of these puzzles, and this game may have more than the first and second game combined, so that's good. I also really like sending these little bots out to scavenge for crafting supplies. You can sit them down anywhere and they'll look for resources while you go about your business, but there are spots where they'll find the optimal amount of junk. So I ended up spending a lot of time backtracking to previous locations to find one of these hot spots and putting one of these adorable little guys to work. This was a surprisingly cool little mechanic and it fit in well with the crafting and sort of serves as a very tiny, almost microscopic band-aid to put over the wound that is this game's obviously shady practices with DLC. Another feather in its cap would be its length. Typically story-driven single-player games like this have a pretty short runtime, but I spent nearly 30 hours on this one, and while that does include side content, the Awakened DLC, and me going back in to get specific footage, I'd say at least a good 20 hours of that was me just playing the game as usual. The best part about that being that it was fun enough that the entire game didn't seem like a slog, so I can appreciate when a developer makes doing the same thing for 20-ish hours stay fun and interesting the whole time. And I guess that means we should probably take all this disparate information and condense it down into something you guys can actually absorb. Dead Space 3 is about as far from the other Dead Space titles as it possibly could be. It seems clear the money-making trends of the early 2010s were all squeezed into this one package, and I don't exactly need powers of clairvoyance to see that this was all clearly EA stepping in and trying to ensure they actually made a return on investment this time. And to be totally honest, this happens to varying degrees with nearly every AAA release in the industry. The only difference being most companies have the wherewithal to not make their meddling so damn painfully obvious, whereas EA might as well have printed their intentions on the box. I will say that it is a relief to see practices like this becoming more and more rare in modern games, but going back to this dark age of game development does make me worry for the future a little bit. All in all, I wouldn't call Dead Space 3 a terrible mess or an unplayable game, and truth be told, a majority of my complaints come from me expecting something that lives up to the established high mark of quality seen in the other games. Of course, there are very real issues that exist outside of my own biases or expectations, but I would wager a lot of these have to do with visceral cramming several diametrically opposed game mechanics into one package. Dead Space as a series had an identity before this. You knew what to expect when you picked one of these games up, but if we use 3 as a barometer, the next DS game, if we ever see one, could be a first-person open-world base builder with Dark Souls combat, and it genuinely wouldn't surprise me. Listen, the point is, the worst offense you're going to find in this game is the disrespect it pays to all the effort that it took to get the series where it was up to this point. For a short time, we had this slow-building, dark, brutal mix between Alien and The Thing, and it was truly amazing. Then we got to see the big Hollywood version of such an approach, and while it did lose a little of that hungry, independent feel, it still felt undeniably like a Dead Space game. And now? Well, we have nearly any game that released during the Xbox 360 era. Just pick one and it probably plays exactly like that. The bright and unique colors of the rainbow may look beautiful and vibrant on their own, but what happens when we combine them all together? Each one loses its appeal and we're left with this gray, unrecognizable mass, and I think that's what we have here. A game trying so hard to be like the other titles that surrounded it on launch that it somehow forgot to be Dead Space in the end. Again, I want to reiterate, I'm not saying this is a bad game in the general context of video games. It plays really well and it can be really fun sometimes. What this is though is a slap in the face to people who are expecting something that would even remotely look like Dead Space. And now that I think about it, it seems to be a damn near universal opinion. In fact, for the last few months, my Twitter and YouTube comment section has been two-thirds full of people expressing their condolences for me having to play a game that went so far out of its way to shit on everything that made it popular in the first place. And yet, it seems like when that same argument gets used against the FF7 remake, a lot of you seem to change your tune. Interesting, that. 
Well, I've gone off on a rant here, but the main point is I actually do recommend Dead Space 3. I found the location, set pieces, and subject matter kept me interested the entire time. The combat in Dead Space 3 was hot garbage for a while, but when I figured out I couldn't approach it like other DS titles, I started actually having fun. Was it as fun as Part 2's visceral and amazingly energetic combat? Well, no way in hell, but it's still pretty okay with moments of actual greatness hidden in there. So if you're like me and all the negative reviews have kept you away up till now, maybe think about grabbing a cheap used copy off of eBay for next to nothing or a digital version in some kind of sale, and you might find more entertainment than you bargained for. One thing I can guarantee you won't find, though, is something that plays like a Dead Space title and without hyperbole. That is a goddamn shame. As the first game in the Dead Space line to try out co-op multiplayer as its main focus, I'd be remiss if I didn't take advantage of it. So I put out the word on my Patreon, and one of my supporters was nice enough to jump in a game with me, and I have to say I was really surprised at how it changed the overall feel of the game. Speaking of which, I want to give a giant thanks to Jazzo McSpazzo for hopping in a multiplayer session with me and being cool as all hell. If you guys want to show her some love, I'll link her Twitch channel in the description. Before we get into any of that stuff though, there is one giant negative to cover here. Playing this game with a friend can suck any emotion or impact from the story scenes, and I think that's something that probably doesn't need to be said, but honestly, those story cutscenes were most of what I enjoyed about 3, so if you're like me and really enjoy turning your brain off and falling into a game's world, maybe give the single player campaign a try first. And when you do finish the game and decide to start it up with a buddy, I think you'll find the true form it was meant to take from the very beginning. Remember my video covering Dead Space 2 where I said it was some of the most fun I've had in years? And remember a few minutes ago when I mentioned how frustrated I was with Part 3 for feeling nothing like that? Well, ladies, gentlemen, I give you the solution to that issue. Having two guns aimed at the same necromorph really improves the experience here, and it seems clear that this was how the game was balanced for difficulty. In the main game, I had issues with enemies getting right in my face, and I just didn't have the firepower to deal with them in a satisfying way. And like you would imagine, another player perfectly accounts for this. And on a quick note, the pure chaos of bullets flying from every direction and explosions going off all around while me and my partner had to keep our heads on swivels thanks to the increased enemy numbers and damage output made for such a hectic and frankly awesome time. It is genuinely an experience I'd recommend all of you jumping into if you can. Like I said before, during my time in multiplayer I kept getting these brief flashes of the frantic and action-packed fun that came from mowing down necromorphs in part 2. The speed and intensity of fights were hitting peak levels of fun, and on top of that, the difficulty felt so much more, I guess, appropriate. In this multiplayer session, I died quite a few times, but it never felt like a cheap death to me. Even on the hard difficulty, it always felt like it was my fault when I ended up getting taken out, and that's exactly what I was looking for in the single player. After experiencing what feels like the intended gameplay method here, I can very much see why people were so upset at DS3 when it launched. This multiplayer approach, while fun is all hell, clearly deviates a great deal from the isolating feel of past entries. From what I can see, this multiplayer mode is exactly what people wanted for their single player experience the whole time, and it would have honestly been very easy to deliver on, but it seems to me that no one at Visceral or EA even considered the possibility that someone would want to play this game without a partner. It took me a very long time to figure this out because I was having so much fun with the multiplayer and a moderate amount of fun with single player, but all the hate that I was picking up on towards this game wasn't because it failed at what it was trying to do, but more because it succeeded at not doing anything the fans of the series wanted. Which, and I know I need to stop making this point, but it seems odd to me how much overlap there is between people who are upset that EA made such sweeping and uncharacteristic changes to Dead Space's established gameplay and people who feel that Resident Evil 4's almost mirror approach was the best thing that ever happened to video games. Hypocrisy thy name is RE4 stands. Now don't get me wrong, a games developer has every right to change what they see fit in their own creation, but the underlying reasons for that change should always be in service of providing a better and more well-rounded experience to the players. And it seems clear that this specific change was made more to capitalize on the pretty staggering success of Resident Evil 5 and its well-received multiplayer gameplay as opposed to something they thought would actually work in a Dead Space title. As someone who has only recently dived down into the Dead Space rabbit hole, I feel a little sad at what could have been had EA left Visceral to their devices, but I can imagine a longtime fan of the series might have felt at least the slightest bit of betrayal at this move. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, I can most definitely sympathize. So if you're looking for an amazingly fun gameplay experience, I'd say multiplayer is very much the way to go here. But if you can't bring yourself to play what feels like the soulless, cash-grabby, Mountain Dew and Doritos-sponsored portion of the game, well, I think I can see where you're coming from. 
Okay, so I know I use this term maybe a little more than I should, but Dead Space 3's presentation is very much a one step forward, two step back type of situation, which is very strange since each Dead Space game has wowed me in one way or another, but Part 3 is the first game in the series that I noticed little details that made it look much worse than the titles that came before it. Thankfully, once again, we have a big emphasis on moody lighting and dynamic shadow casting, which, in my opinion, still looks great, but there's some other things going on here that, well, don't. For example, in my last numbered video on the series, I complained about the switch from the more realistic facial designs and animations of Part 1 to the more cartoony and stylized faces in 2, but 3 continues that regression to a near comical degree. <laughs> Genuinely, I'm asking you guys because I don't know. What in the hell am I looking at here? On one hand, Isaac seems to be slowly transforming into some kind of struck match insect hybrid in front of our very eyes, and that's not even mentioning the humanoid ape standing next to him. I honestly don't understand what made them think putting less artistry and effort into the faces of a story-based video game was a good idea. I mean, look at Ellie over here. Remember her looking fairly good in part two? Well, toss that right out of your head because she seems to have far less points of articulation in her face this time around. And for those of you that don't understand the lingo, just watch her while she talks. You can see her lips wrap around a center point while she moves them. Now, luckily, this doesn't happen to Isaac, but I mean, come on. Ellie is a main character who shares a not insubstantial amount of screen time with the Clark. These kind of rookie mistakes should not be happening in the production of a AAA title with this much funding, let alone one handled by a developer who not only has proven to have an eye for artistry, but already has high quality assets to work from. How did they undo all the good work they did making Ellie's animations emotionally convincing before? I honestly don't get what happened here. Across the board, I found cutscenes to be incredibly hard to watch because everyone's face seems to be partially paralyzed, and keep in mind, this is the base they were building from. Look at all the detail on the eyebrows and lips. Like I said before, these faces may look a little more cartoony compared to what I enjoyed about the first game, but I don't think you could argue that they were poorly made. They genuinely look great, but comparatively speaking, at least when 3 is concerned, these are works of art. And believe me, I know, I can be very hard on elements like this. In fact, obsessing over small details is sort of my modus operandi, but honestly let me know in the comments. Am I insane or is there a giant discrepancy between the faces in part 2 and 3? I'm honestly interested to hear what you guys think. Now, I can't spend this entire video talking about facial modeling and animations, even though you know damn well I want to, so let's move on to something else I think Visceral may have mishandled. Throughout Dead Space 3, I kept seeing these amazing looking room layouts and great sky boxes, but something was just off. For a while, I really couldn't put my finger on what was wrong, but there seemed to have been something keeping me from admiring these awesome looking vistas and interesting interior areas. Well, after going back and looking at my footage of Dead Space 1 and 2, I think I may have figured it out. Dead Space 3 leans heavily on a very high contrast look. No matter what part of the game you're at, you'll notice an unnatural difference between the brightest brights and the darkest darks. Kind of like they threw some kind of cheap HDR filter over the game. And I have to admit, there are plenty of games who use this kind of a look and make it work for them, but for some reason it just isn't doing anything for me here, and in my opinion, was done kind of cheaply and possibly by someone who doesn't understand what they were doing. There also seems to be this emphasis on wrapping more complicated textures around the geometry of the environments, but these textures with all of their very small details look more low res than those found in Dead Space 1 or 2. This makes Dead Space 3 seem so much more busy looking and less visually appealing than similar scenes in previous games, and to prove that, I tried to find shots from 2 that sort of mirror ones in 3 as far as color brightness and composition goes, and I think you guys will agree that 3 over here on the right may look very good, but it seems to be much more muddy and dirty looking than 2. The more simplistic approach to the design in Part 2 leads to this extreme level of clarity while playing 3 for long periods of time, I actually got visually fatigued. Something I can admit might just be an issue with my eyes, but I think this also led me into way more cheap hits as far as gameplay is concerned. And what I mean by that is I was way less able to track moving targets efficiently over some of the more busy looking backgrounds and floor textures. It was like the mess of pixels darting around on screen were being camouflaged against the mess of pixels that made up the environment. These missteps could be very easy to forgive in most scenarios because, truth be told, they're not flaws in and of themselves. Every game is going to have a different approach to how it models and displays its assets, but if you play these games one after the other like I have, 
You would expect to see things improve as time goes on, but that is not the case in a lot of ways here. But that being said, I don't want you to take this as me saying this game looks bad, because in 99.9% .9 of scenarios, I think it looks really, really good. It just doesn't look as good as the game that came before it. And for a development house who knows what they're doing in the realm of making video games look really great, you'd figure there would be a huge improvement here, and that's just not the case. Now, since I started this section off talking a whole lot of shit about Dead Space 3, it's only fair that I talk about the ways that it impressed me, and to be sure, there's a lot of that to talk about. The starting area reminded me of certain parts of the sprawl in Part 2, but looked even more convincing. I've always enjoyed more urban settings for video games, because not only is that the environment I'm most familiar with, but it can also be a pretty complicated look to pull off convincingly, and thankfully DS3 does just that. Sadly, this does only make up a very small portion of the game, but there's other good news too. The more open, snow-covered environments are really great to look at, not just in the exterior areas, but the frozen interiors look great too. After running around in knee-high snow while taking hits from frozen necromorphs literally rising up from the ground beneath me, ducking into a frozen over little bunker or barracks gave me very hard The Thing vibes, and I have no problem admitting that's one property I'd be A-OK -okay with more people ripping off. On top of that, the wide open, seemingly endless space area in the very beginning looks absolutely stunning. There's debris and refuge floating all around, and even though I know a majority of it is 2D assets put across the background, it does have this very, very pleasing look. The high expectations I have with Dead Space titles and really attractive real-time lighting are no secret, and I'm happy to say DS3 gives me no complaints in that category. In my last video, you guys might remember I complained that while still looking great, the lighting of Part 2 ditched the hard edges of light sources in favor of a more realistic, diffused, but less appealing approach. And 3 seems to have married these two ideas, which is really awesome. Light rays still have very hard, well-defined, boundaries, I guess, for lack of a better word, which helps them really stand out from the environment, but in between those boundaries, there's still a very soft, nearly volumetric quality to the lighting. Plus, it seems like there are way more dynamic light sources this time around, and that's something that'll get no complaints from me. I will say that particles getting caught in the light no longer look as sharp and defined as they used to, but they still look great, so I can't really get up in arms about that. The menus and UI all follow the same design trends from the previous games, and to be honest, I can't really tell if they aren't just the same exact assets. Something I'm not too worried about at all, because honestly, they perfectly nailed these aspects in the first game, so seeing this level of consistency and design is very refreshing. As an odd little side note, it seems like the main menu was made to run at 30 frames per second, so when you push it past that on a platform like, say, the PC, the animations all speed up as well, which is kind of funny to watch. Now, I know people have had issues with the suits in 3 losing a lot of the visual identity they had in the original games, and there's no denying that, but they still look pretty cool to me. That being said, I would have preferred more of the first game's look when it came to the helmets, which looks a lot more like a welding mask than something that would be used in combat, but since we can't rely on the justification of Isaac being an engineer showing up for a day's work, I think we can all let that one slide. I will say the more military look in some of these helmets and the separate eye holes that give off light definitely reminded me of Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, but I can't really say if that's a positive or negative. I guess you make the call there. The Necromorphs have had a pretty massive shift in their design, and to be honest, I sort of like it. Nearly every enemy you will come across in this game are going to look much more recognizably human, or at least more human-shaped compared to previous games, and while you could certainly argue this goes against the philosophy behind their existence, I don't know, I sort of dig it. I don't exactly know why, in a lore sense, freshly turned corpses on the Ishimura turn into formless bundles of flesh, but corpses left on Tal Volantis for hundreds of years retain their more human proportions and features, but they sort of remind me of zombies and, hey, what do you want? I'm a simple man with simple taste. But on top of that, these things now have easily recognizable eyes and mouths, which make it a little easier to remember that they used to be a human. For me at least, that increased this feeling of dread that Dead Space is so fond of permeating throughout its titles. The last area of the game has this alien architecture and technology look to it, which was really effective, and the tiny flourishes that show humans were here at one point studying it just drives home a lot of the story elements really well. Just like in previous Dead Space titles, performance was rock solid for me on the PC with zero dips below the 100 frames per second limit I set it to. An achievement that might not mean much for a title nearly pushing 10 years old, but at the time these titles were incredibly well optimized and I can personally attest to that. I ran both the first and second Dead Space games when they launched on a GTX 1070 and AMD Phenom X4, and from what I hear I would have been able to do the same thing with 3. 
That's very impressive. Look, I think with all the controversy tied to the recent release of Cyberpunk 2077, we can all appreciate a well-optimized PC gaming experience, but we can't base everything off the game's PC performance, so let's jump into my favorite part of making these videos and compare the ports. You two will become one of us, a true believer. Starting off with the 360 version, I was actually very impressed. In the last two Dead Space 360 ports, performance could dip pretty substantially without notice, but with Part 3, it wasn't anywhere near as bad. Of course, there were some moments where the frame rate would take a noticeable dive, but these didn't come during firefights or at times when I needed to react to things quickly. Actually, it seemed like having some of the calm overlays on screen was a big contender in frame rate loss, which is really odd, but Overall, I'd say this was a big step up from what I'm used to in the series. Graphically, I have no complaints at all. In fact, there are some areas that look a little smoother than what I saw on PC. Now, this is thanks to a lower operating resolution, which, for those of you that don't know, 360 and PS3 games render their pictures at 720p internally and allocate resources to upscaling that picture to 1080p instead of using way more resources to render it out at more than double the pixels. This little trick solved a lot of visual issues I had with the PC port, like the messy look of it and the high contrast effect looking bad with the lower res textures. And this same thing helped out with these lower resolution pre-rendered scenes that play to give the illusion of traveling from one location to the next here in the skip. On the PC release, these pre-renders playing in front of the windshield stand out like a sore thumb, but here on console I doubt very much anyone even noticed they weren't rendered in real time. I know I already talked about the relatively solid frame rate, but I should probably also mention this game targets 30 frames per second, and while I can really appreciate them nailing that target most of the time, it is really hard playing an action game at that speed. But I think that might be the textbook definition of a first world problem. As far as gameplay is concerned, I once again have to mention that I just flat out suck at using controllers for any kind of high accuracy shooting in games, so I was getting my ass kicked throughout this whole run, even with the difficulty dialed down to normal. Luckily, this game seems to know about this issue, and I was flush with healing items the entire time, despite not once crafting them. So, I guess if you're like me and can't play shooting games without a mouse and keyboard, you won't have to worry about this game beating your ass the whole time. And since I can't find anything particularly off or noteworthy with this port, why not move on to the PS3 release? Have you seen this man? Please. Where is he? I don't know! Ah! 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 And right from the start, I noticed the picture on PS3 is considerably softer than on 360. I mean, it doesn't ruin the way the game looks or anything, but I imagine there were at least a few people who had to turn up the sharpness on their TV while playing this. As far as performance goes, I didn't notice any frame rate dips that weren't present in the 360 version, which is actually really nice to see. This port of the game does seem to have a slight difference in brightness, even with both releases set to default values in the options. This slightly darker picture did make the game look a little better to my eye, but that same thing can be done in any release through the options menu, so we're not going to count this one as a win for the PS3 specifically. What I will count as a win, though, is the fact that the PS3 controls were just so much more natural feeling to me. My fingers for some reason seem to instinctively move across a PS3 controller with no real delay or microsecond of second guessing, whereas my experience on 360 had me constantly forgetting which trigger was primary and which one was secondary fire. Now to be fair, this might be because I had already played the game on console and I was just getting used to the key bindings, but the PS3 would definitely be the way I'd prefer to play this game if I had to play it on console. And before we close this little section out, let's check out each competitor side by side. As you can see, the 360 wins in terms of sharpness by a considerable degree, but to be totally honest, I still might recommend the PS3 version just for its better controls, but again, that is just a personal thing. Okay, I know I already said this, but I do think it bears repeating. If you just got to the end of this section, you might think all of the negative comments means that this game looks bad in my opinion, but it really doesn't. There were a lot of parts in this game where I had to stop in my tracks and just admire the scenery. The lighting was also to die for for most of the time, and I really enjoyed how visually chaotic the action set pieces were. That being said, in pursuit of those great looking scenes, we're left with graphical assets that don't even hold up to a game that launched two years ago on the same engine and using roughly the same exact team. What went wrong with the game's faces, I don't think I'll ever know, but I can tell you one thing for sure. If this was done in service of making the faces look more realistic, well, I think we can confidently assign a loss there. That is, of course, unless I'm missing some very deep lore that states everyone in the future suffers from severe fetal alcohol syndrome. So in closing, Dead Space 3, a great looking game that somehow, and this is incredibly weird, looks better and worse than its predecessor at the same time. Honestly, I think I could have shortened this section to just that sentence and saved you all a lot of time. 
I'm the marker killer, remember? Well, guys, I have a bit of a hard job here. On one end, a lot of you were right. This game was a goddamn disappointment. But that being said, I don't think I would call it a bad game. Despite how hard EA fought to make this not the case, DS3 does feel like a Dead Space game most of the time. Sure, it feels awkward and uncomfortable to be ducking in and out of cover when I'm used to dismembering necromorphs instead, but the core of a Dead Space experience is still in there. If I had to take a guess, I would say the claims that this game is so terrible probably come from two different places. First off, we have people who are mad as hell that clear attempts were made to push players into buying crafting materials or weapons to help with how weak early game offensive options are compared to how fast and hard enemies can hit. And to be totally honest, I see exactly where these guys are coming from. It's a scummy practice, and while we can't exactly confirm that EA was behind that push, there's a giant mountain of evidence pointing in that direction and most of it is EA's logo on the box. In this sense, I can 100% understand people's frustration here, but I don't necessarily think it ruins the game. It certainly takes away from what fun could be had otherwise, but by the middle of the game, I was kicking ass and enjoying the hell out of it. So it's definitely possible to have a satisfying experience here, but I will warn you, you'll have to make it a few hours into the game to get there. And yes, that is nowhere near ideal, but I play RPGs all the time that don't hit their stride till hour 12, so I very well may be a bad judge on this specific problem. The next issue I think people likely wrestled with was the betrayal of seeing a series they grew to love being homogenized and turned into this formless mass that somehow resembled every popular game that existed in its time. And again, I cannot fault anyone for feeling this way, especially after being the guy who still complains about RE games no longer having tank controls. Obviously, my ability to stay objective in the face of nostalgia is not ironclad. But once again, I'm in a very lucky position where that doesn't matter to me quite as much as others. I only just recently got to play most of these games for this retrospective, so I can't exactly say that I formed an overly emotional connection to Dead Space. If this were a series I had more of a stake in, you bet your sweet ass I'd be right there with you, but that not being the case, I honestly enjoyed myself. This game may have half-assed, barely functional cover-based shooting, and you may need to fight people actually holding guns, but on the plus side, you aren't going to see these mechanics very often. The bulk of your gameplay will still consist of cutting the living dead into pieces. The added crafting system might be a shallow attempt at emulating a popular trend, but to be honest, once again, I enjoyed it. This may sound crazy, but all the weapon customization sort of reminded me how much fun I had optimizing my arsenal in Parasite Eve. And if you specifically don't like the idea of crafting, the good news is I came across most high-end upgrades and weapon parts just through playing the game normally and picking up loot, so if you don't like that stuff or hoarding resources, you can still get a similar experience to someone who does. So both camps lobbing deserved criticism at DS3 are technically in the right here, or at least I can see where they're coming from, but from my personal perspective, Dead Space 3 is a really fun game. To be fair, I think the story is what drove me through the experience most of the time, but the gameplay was fun for me, and despite a massive list of complaints here in this video, I can't really fault it for too much, at least mechanically speaking. If you absolutely love the gameplay style that the series has developed for itself, I can totally understand you not getting into this one on principle alone. I may not agree with you in this specific instance, but it is a sentiment that I am all too familiar with. That being said, if you like the other DS titles and have been wondering about this one after staying away because of all the negative reviews, like myself, I think you might be surprised here. If I had to hold it up to the other games in the franchise, it certainly doesn't have the slow-paced and creeping horror of the first game, and only towards the end does it even start to come close to the visceral and engaging combat from Part 2, but as a very action-heavy experience similar to the set-piece-driven games of its time, I think it holds its own, honestly. So this one's going to be a toss-up, guys. I may have enjoyed Dead Space 3 a lot more than I planned on, but as I'm writing this, I can't confidently say that you will. There are a lot of issues present here that have never been problems in previous games, and I think that speaks volumes for how much unfamiliar ground these guys were covering thanks to a little creative input from EA. You know, that company that made a career out of meddling with successful studios until their games start sucking, and then closing those studios down because their alterations caused the games to suck. Visceral were clearly in their element when designing the first two games, and Part 3 is perfect evidence that they worked best when making the game they wanted to make, and not some kind of carbon copy of the entire mid-2000s gaming market. It may be overstated at this point, but this game serves as a testament to how bad a creative work can turn out when the creative decisions are left up to executive types who wouldn't know a good idea if it blasted off their arms and legs with a plasma cutter. So maybe give this one a look if you've stayed away for a while or found the footage in this video to be even a little bit attractive to your specific tastes. 
It may be the worst game in the series, but that definitely doesn't mean it's a bad game. And in a bittersweet sort of way, this lukewarm conclusion marks the end of my little romp through a series I just flat out ignored up till now. And I will say proudly, I am so happy you guys pushed me so hard to dive into the Dead Space franchise. I have had some genuinely awesome moments with this series and found a level of fun that I never see anymore. This was a great time for me and beyond that I was flat out blown away at how easy it was for me to just fall into this world and its characters. The fleshed out nature of all the lore you'll find throughout these DS media releases made this one of the most real feeling and well described fictional universes I've ever come across before. Normally how it works is a game will provide me with some cursory info and my imagination will fill in the blanks and build the rest up from there. but. I think this might be the first time I didn't have to do that. Everything from how the government operates to what clothes people wear and products they consume was laid out in one way or another and I really enjoyed that. In closing, Dead Space was an innovative and refreshingly unique spot on a timeline that most could describe as featureless. It dared to follow its own unique gameplay style at a time when copying the guys next to you was the norm and the crazy part was, it worked. They found real success by sticking to their own ideas, and it says a lot that they only failed when venturing outside of that comfort zone. Visceral deserves a lot of credit for what they accomplished, and if you ask me, the gaming landscape could use more companies like them. So how about we hear it for a group of guys that had the balls to make a horror game when they weren't supposed to, a third person shooter when every other release had to be first person, and focused on an organically satisfying experience while the rest of the industry was busy trying to figure out how to combine Call of Duty with Uncharted. And while we're on the subject of gratitude and even bigger thanks to you guys for showing so much support up to this point and pushing me to keep challenging myself, I can confidently say that my content is what it is because you guys have kept me moving forward and more importantly you've kept me honest. I truly hope you ended up enjoying this detailed analysis of a franchise I might have missed out on otherwise and until I figure out what the hell I'm going to do next, thank you all very much for watching the Dead Space Retrospective. Yo, that was a bit of a trek, huh? Well, we finally made it to the end and I'm pretty pumped at what lies ahead. I have a few projects I'm working on and I think you guys will really get a kick out of them, but if you want to support future series retrospectives like this one, I'd appreciate a quick trip over to my Patreon page. Even if a dollar a month seems like too insignificant an amount to contribute to small creators like myself, it can truly mean the world. If that's something you can't do though, just know I appreciate you all the same. After all, it's only the most dedicated to make it this far. That tells me you genuinely enjoy what I do here and that does mean a lot. And I think that's about enough appreciation out of me, but I will see all of you guys next time, so stay safe until then.